Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Gippsland Careers Night. My name is Michael Milwatney. I'm a paediatrician and uh, also the director of the Gippsland Regional Training Hub. Why rural? Why rural and regional? Well, the question is, why not? Um, and uh, having been a, uh, a initially a metro guy when I first started in my life journey as a clinician, um, I uh, have certainly never regretted uh, the transition into a regional paediatric role. Uh, and certainly the, uh, the reasons for that, my own personal reasons, for that, which I expect will be shared by many other clinicians that will talk tonight, are uh, really about the level of clinical exposure that you get, uh, which is quite unique. In, and certainly it's really unique depending on even the location of the rural site. So it's extremely varied over the over over the uh, the locations that you may end up working so in my personal journey i spent uh my advanced training years after completing my basic training at the children's hospital in melbourne in darwin and spent uh, three two to three years there and then became a consultant there for several years and certainly that's a very different rural experience or regional experience to what I've then subsequently experienced in gippsland um, which is again um, extremely uh, broad and exciting, but I think that there's some common themes across the rural experience and certainly uh, the degree of autonomy I think that you get as a rural clinician uh, and the degree of uh, high quality clinical exposure. Uh, when, I, when I say autonomy, I'm talking about the fact that when you, uh, you may, may well be, unlike in, in large metropolitan hospitals, you may well be the first person other than the, the person who's either referred them to you from ED or from general practice be the first person to really have a, a good a good critical look at them uh, at the patient and make some kind of initial formulation of what the issues are whereas uh, if you're in a metropolitan site you might have multiple tiers of people that have to give you have to before you're actually allowed to actually have any say in, in either the diagnosis or management I think that's a, a key difference and you're also in a small team environment, which I think small teams are, are really uh, are really very val val valuable in terms of uh, the mentoring and nurturing that you can achieve in a, in a small team environment where everybody is a valued team member. Um, and also the, the breadth across the team, which is um, starting from the most junior people, um, possibly including the, the uh, allied health team and, and nursing staff, um, they, they're not necessarily directly part of the medical team, but they're certainly part of the multidisciplinary team. But the even the most junior person, that would, might be the medical student on the team, can contribute. And I think the medical students find that, that uh, being involved in small team environments in rural and regional sites, much more inclusive than uh, perhaps some of their experiences in larger, um, uh, you know, multi-tiered metropolitan centres. Uh, I think the... The other thing I, I would point out, and I'm going to go on to lifestyle in a second, but um, opportunities that don't exist in Metro, uh, which are things like public hospital appointments and how very difficult to get in a metropolitan area. Um, uh, I think leadership roles are, are harder to actually access in uh, metropolitan hospitals because of the, the size of the, and the, the unwieldy nature of the behemoth of, of a, a large health service whereas you'll be working in smaller, more intimate health services. So public hospital appointments are much more uh, um, accessible in a rural and regional site. Uh, leadership roles within the, the structure are, are very much more available. And then even uh, peripheral things like uh, university appointments are, uh, um, are certainly much more, with, without doubt, you're in a rural and regional site, you will be teaching from early on and you will have a, a significant role in in education, if you choose to, um, but also you can have a, a substantial role uh, as a leader in education if you feel that that's something that you're interested in. I would certainly recommend if you're interested in a uh, regional medical career that um, you have a look at www.regionalmedicaltraining.com.au. It talks about different specialties individually and also uh, where you can do training across uh, the regional site. The last point, um, and I left this because I, I wanted to leave the best to last. I think the thing that I've enjoyed most about being a rural clinician has been the lifestyle that it has um, uh, allowed myself and my family to access. 
you know, we're relatively close to a metropolitan centre, but but even so, the clinical activity is very like a far more remote site um, based in Gippsland. I think the, uh, the the things about Gippsland that I just love are the the, the scenery, the lifestyle, um, you know, the markets, the all of the the great stuff, the, the cycling, skiing, uh, access to the beaches, access to the mountains. It's just a beautiful place to live. In fact, uh, having travelled recently quite extensively across Australia, I, I must say that Tasmania and Victoria are blessed with uh, an extraordinarily uh, diverse geographical, um, you know, exciting environment. And certainly Gippsland is particularly blessed and is almost the undiscovered country. I think yeah, you uh, you can really do just about anything in Gippsland. Uh, I think the, uh, the the other thing about being a person who works and lives in your own community is that uh, I mean, this can be a downside as well. You're not um, you're not anonymous, um, but uh, you are part of helping your own local community. And I think that's a really you know it's not for everybody because some people like anonymity, but but in in a regional area that's not going to happen. You're not going to be anonymous, but you'll certainly contribute to the patients and the people that are uh, in your immediate you know, environment and, and to the point where sometimes you'll actually be caring for families, family members of close friends, which you know, adds a bit of extra extra challenge, shall we say, but it's still very rewarding. And I think the, uh, you'll find that a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the positive feedback you get will be from that community interaction, the interaction with, the, with people that you actually work, live and play with, which is what we are aiming to achieve in terms of the long-term outcome for all of our trainees. So regional training hubs are all about developing an interesting environment for you guys to explore the opportunities that are available for rural training. And it's not just, uh, not just in one area, it's across all of various vocations within the medical sphere. Uh, that, that will include a whole range of them, including um, the general medical teams, general surgery, ED. So, for example, general medicine's got basic training and advanced training opportunities uh, in, uh, in Gippsland. As I mentioned, uh, Dr. Syed or Mr. Syed is involved in, uh, in, in evolving and being involved in developing a general surgical advanced training program. There is a very successful um, uh, model for this, uh, which is in Western Victoria, and has done extraordinarily well in terms of producing outstanding regional surgeons uh, and 100% pass rate so far from that program. Uh, ED um, is certainly in terms of basic training and advanced training is certainly an opportunity. Anesthetics, basic training and advanced training are, are certainly available in regional Victoria. The Victorian Basic Pediatric Training Consortium uh, are running a pediatrics program, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but certainly in pediatrics, if you're within the training program, you can certainly do all of your basic or a mixed mixture of, uh, of your uh, core and non-core requirements in regional. Uh, that's the um, extended rural stream, as we call it, that group of uh, which is expanding to six trainees in uh, 2024, uh, are based primarily in, in regional Victoria. Psychiatry program is, is also extremely successful across regional Victoria. And uh, Stuart Thomas is going to talk a little bit about that later. General practice in terms of the, the rural, rural generalist and non-rural generalist programs are all uh, very, very active. There's medical administration, radiology, college intensive care medicine, uh, ONG. In fact, the, the 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 opportunities are pretty much limitless. So I think uh, hopefully I've uh, given a bit of a flavour for what is available and why it's so good. Um, I don't um, I don't feel that uh, I need to sell it any further. So I'm going to at this point I'm going to hand over to my colleague and friend Dr. David Nguyen, who's going to talk a little bit about his life and experience in emergency. My name is David William, the Deputy Director of Emergency Medicine at Warrigal. I also work at uh, La Trobe Regional Hospital. So I came uh, into uh, the Gippsland area, started out in uh, November of uh, 2011. 
at the asking of then director Ken Lim, Dr. Ken Lim, uh, he said, uh, come give me a hand I, uh, just for a couple of months uh, because uh, we're in trouble down here. So that couple of months turned into 2023 now, as you can see, uh, because uh, I've met so many uh, passionate people that work in that uh, in in the ED while I have that opportunity to work there, and uh, it's such a great uh, great journey that I've been uh, uh, very fortunate to to have and uh, be part of of the growing at the Warrigal, um, you know, I, uh, it's like what Michael has said, the, the, the lifestyle is, uh, if, if you enjoy uh, the outdoors, this, this is the place to be, the Gippsland area. If you in, enjoy working with a great team that are friendly and, and uh, you know, very supportive uh, and close knit, then, this is the right place to be. So I can't uh, speak much about uh, all the other uh, specialty. Uh, Michael has mentioned a little bit about it already, but I uh, can tell you that uh, the ED training in uh, Warrigal, unfortunately, we lost our accreditation and we only have accreditation for uh, uh, the rural aspect of the uh, of component of the FASM training program. So, in order to make sure that the ED is functioning well, we've, we've turned into uh, um, sort of uh, a, a GP Akram sort of training uh, area aspect of it. Now, because uh, the primary is uh, for the FASM training program is very similar to uh, what the Akram GP uh, exam will be. And uh, just to let uh, you know, before we lost our accreditation, we have a 100% passing rate for the primary exam. That's 10 registrars that we've got through. Uh, thanks to Gary, this uh, campaign that started off that program with us, uh, we've had a very successful uh, group of uh, uh, of uh, primary uh, FASM uh, 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 passed the exam. Uh, uh, and also two uh, Akram GPs already passed the exam through our uh, extensive teaching program. So if you are interested in doing a rural uh, sort of uh, ED aspect of it and enjoy a GP aspect of it as well, uh, I encourage you to do the ACRAM training and GP training and come to us with it. Uh, we'll get you through the exam without a, without any problem at all. We have uh, 19 uh, um, Specialists that's working in uh, LED and and our I must say our teaching is second to none. Uh, no one had that record uh, passing. And plus now uh, I'll tell you the program of what uh, ED sh should uh, have, and especially in the rural area. So there's a there's what we call with the ASIM College is uh, an EMC uh, Emergency Medicine Certificate. Well, that just get you if you're PGY two or you're on uh, provisional or or um, or limited uh, registration, you can still do the EMC. That'll get you to do uh, sort of practicing uh, as a, a a resident in ED and be able to uh, see probably eighty percent of uh, of the presentation there. So the next step uh, and that's involved about six months. Uh, that program involved about six months uh, of training in order to take the exam and, and, and get the emergency medicine certificate. Now, the next one up is the emergency medicine diploma. You can sure join uh, and do that. That will be six months involvement. Uh, no, that's one year involvement, I'm sorry. Uh, and the diploma will get you to work uh, as a, a, a senior registrar, uh, uh, similar to a, a registrar in. Uh, in a um, ASIM program, uh, whereas they have the the advanced emergency medicine diploma, that's a two years uh, requirement, and that'll get you to, to be a, able to go around uh, the country and work independently uh, as a career medical officer in any ED around uh, 
around Australia. So that's basically uh, uh, the, the kind of thing that we can offer at the moment at, uh, at Warrigal. However, um, uh, at La Trobe, they still have their accreditation there. But it, uh, I know it's a long way to travel, but if uh, anyone's interested in a, a ASIM uh, program, uh, um, training program there, I encourage you to have a chat with Dr. Tony Chan. Thank you, David. So our next contributor is Dr. James A. Sullivan, who is in training as a rural generalist. He's completed two years of his GP training with ACRAM, um, which is the Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine and is currently based at Central Gippsland Health Service in Sale, where he is completing an advanced specialty year in anaesthetics. Thanks for that, Michael. Um, yes, so um, as you mentioned, I'm a, still a registrar. I've done my two years in um, general practice and I'm doing my advanced specialty year, which is um, all I need to do from a time perspective for ACRAM. Um, I think most people will be aware we've got two general practice training colleges in Australia, which is the um, Australian College of Rural and Remote Medicine, or ACRAM, as well as RACGP, which is the Royal Australian College of General Practice. Um, I think they're both quite similar in terms of training and until recently had been trained uh, mainly hand in hand, but that's all changed. Um, RACGP's got uh, the hospital year and then your two general practice years. ACRAM has the two general practice years as well as a um, advanced specialty year, which, uh, as David mentioned, can be done in emergency medicine, could be done in anaesthetics, as I'm doing, obstetrics, um, or for in some um, non-procedural um, such as paediatrics, internal medicine, palliative care, and uh, quite a few other ones as well. Um, in terms of um, some of the pros and cons and differences in the rural, um, I've only done my term rurally, um, and I think it's a really good way to do things. Um, the Some of the differences will be some of the work you do. So from my perspective, where I've worked in um, South Gippsland in general practice, Often you'll be working both at the general practice as well as in the nursing homes and in the hospital. Um, in the country, often you might be in a smaller place where the hospital is run um, solely or, or primarily, primarily or just to a small degree by general practitioners. Um, and that can be really rewarding work if you don't want to get stuck in the office all day, every day. I think it's a really beneficial way to, to spread out your day. So um, there's no real limit um, when it comes to what you can do in general practice. You can find that you just want to uh, see a bit of everything, um, which is fine. Uh, and anyone who can walk in the door and you can see people and work them up from scratch um, or have your regular regular patient base who might come in regularly for um, for script preventive care and um, any other things. It's also the, the way that you can see a whole family of people and get to know a whole family and understand people's specific situations before they even tell you their problems when you know their parents and their siblings and, and all, all about them already. Um, I think Michael's also mentioned some of the problems with working rurally where sometimes if you do want um, not to have everyone know about yourself as well, that can be a bit challenging and um, there'll always be some patients that might push the boundaries a little bit and try and um, have some form of relationship outside of work, which, which isn't necessary. So that's always something to navigate. Um, but I think overall the benefits of working rurally outweigh that when you can immerse yourself in the community and the, the workplace a bit better. Um, I think we've talked or you've mentioned um, rural generalism as well. So the difference between general practice and rural generalism um, is uh, a bit focusing on the specific set of skills that a GP needs when they work in a more rural or remote area where you might not have access to some of the other specialists so much. Um, so you might need to be managing more complex patients for a bit longer um, because of the lack of access. Uh, or when patients aren't able to leave the community to access those specialists, you might be uh, managing them a bit more too. So that's something that's quite rewarding, um, uh, but it's not necessarily um, the easiest sometimes, particularly if you're trying to get someone appointmented and, and trying to navigate some of the social issues or barriers of them getting to their specialist appointments as well um, when they are further away. Um, but it's also, I think, um, the benefit of being able to pick up a, a different specialty on the side. And that's what I particularly like about um, Akram's course and why I chose to do it um, is doing an advanced specialty year. So for me, I'm doing anaesthetics. And, and again, that's something that you can do that's 
completely different to your normal day-to-day life in general practice clinic. Um, and it, you can pick up some really incredible skills um, in um, in just a different area completely. And I think um, there's quite a bit of demand in the regional and rural areas for these kind of positions as well. Um, for example, the two clinics I've been at, Foster and Langathra in South Gippsland, um, they don't have uh, any ANSCA accredited anaesthetists. They are, are only covered by GP anaesthetists. Um, and that's something that without without having those GP anaesthetists, these, these patients would all be traveling a lot further for all of their operations, be subject to much longer wait times. Um, and so it's something that, that really works for the community. Um, and I think it's really great. I noticed um, Jules is here today. She's with the Victorian Rural Generalist Program and she's really instrumental in providing some funding and, and access and, um, and organizing some of these placements. So I don't know if she's gonna be talking later at all, but, um, but if you're interested in, in general practice training, particularly in Jack general practice and doing some advanced skills, um, Jules would be someone to have a chat to um, about making that happen as well. Then if anybody is interested in rural journalism, um, we can make those pathways happen at just about any of the major um, training centres of Gippsland um, and tailor your pathway to where you are and um, assist you in accessing your um, placements, whether they're in hospital or GP placements. Um, so just get in touch early and we can start to work with you and do your career planning. Uh, Dr. Max William Ubels is an ANSCA anaesthetic registrar with both intensive care and emergency registrar experience in the Gippsland region. And he's going to have a little chat to us about his own journey and experiences in rural and regional. Hi, everyone. So, as uh, thanks for that introduction. Yeah, my name's Max. Um, effectively, I'll talk a bit about how I got here. Um, I was in basically born and bred in Southeast suburbs, but Monash University trained. And in 2016, I spent a year in uh, med school in South Gippsland. I actually met a couple of people here back then. Um, I spent my first three years working at Peninsula Health, which actually involved rotations to one faggy emergency department. And my first year was internship, but my next couple of years were critical care years, which uh, ended up being sort of ED and ICU regging by the end of them. Then I did a year at Easton as a critical care registrar. As some of you may or may not know, anaesthetics is incredibly competitive with some jobs having competition ratios of 120 people applying for one or two positions. Um, and so I sort of, sort of branched out and last year I applied for a critical care position at La Trobe Regional Hospital and I spent the entire year there. I did roughly nine months of ICU and three months of anaesthetics. And with that experience, I, I got quite a lot out of it. So first off, um, uh, then, oh, then I, this year, um, basically through uh, basically being a good worker in the hospital, being known to them and also having the right amount of experience, right place, right time, I got on as an independent anesthetics trainee. And it's a real good pathway. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, first, I'll just talk about what I like about critical care in general and anesthesia. You deal with un critically unwell patients and an anesthesia, that's of your own doing sometimes. There's a high procedural load as a result. There's good team environment and you directly see the consequences of your actions in the short term, both good and bad. And for someone like me, who's got an attention span of a goldfish, it's very, very you know good for that type of personality. You do a decent amount of physiology um, Everything you do and you see in a patient can be explained. And that's something that not many other specialties have, and you can explain it instantly. There's much less diagnostic uncertainty. And the care you can give in a one-to-one -one environment and thought into every single action and the consequences you see and you don't see are emphasized more than I've seen in any other specialty as well. Contrary to popular belief, it's not a specialty for someone who wants to cruise through things. Um, it has, you know, a high degree of attention and stress that you actually have during um, uh, basically uh, your work and during your day. Uh, you've got to have a high degree of control on everything you do. And you also, even though it's got a high degree of consultant flexibility, uh, allowing for things like family life and uh, tr after training and good balance in the life. There's far more, especially in public work, nights and weekend loads than a lot of other specialties. Um, 
the main issue for most of you guys who are getting out of this is, as I mentioned and alluded to before, is the competitive nature of the training program. And that's, that's where training regionally becomes a fantastic option. Um, emails will be distributed. So I'm happy to field as many emails or questions about things you need to do, career preparation, everything like that, because as you can see from my six years of uh, circling around and eventually getting on, um, I've seen everything uh, that I've seen, worked in Metro, I've worked in rural, and I've seen a lot of friends, colleagues, and other people uh, go through various pathways. And I know them all as a result. Um, training regionally. Look, LRH has a lot of, uh, uh, LRH is probably the place for ANSCA accredited, um, uh, basically anesthesia, and it's got a lot of options. From internship, it's one of a few sites. Uh, other regional sites do have, uh, as well, no metropolitan sites have intern rotations in anesthesia. And it's also one of the very few sites that has a PGY2, so second year out, critical care year, which has six months of ICU and three months of anesthesia. So you'd be hard pressed to find many PGY2s who have six months of ICU and, and between three and six months of anesthetics anywhere in the metropolitan area. And that's an incredibly valuable uh, resume. It also anecdotally, from what I've seen over the last couple of years, plus what I've seen elsewhere, has a very high uptake of the PGY2 and PGY3 uh, crit care years into progressive jobs elsewhere. Um, such as jobs that feed directly into the anesthetics training program. Um, this is probably further cemented by the fact that LRH has an independent anesthetics registrar year that will be going through some restructuring soon with a new department, new changes, and new uh, few things, as well as a new theatre complex. Um, but by the time you guys start applying three or four years from now, if you're known to... Uh, if you're known to sort of um, LRH and you've been there and you've done some NSA experience and they know you, there'll be a massive opportunity uh, for you career-wise if you've proven yourself to be a good worker. You'll be in a very competitive position and people have come through that way and gotten large amounts of very coveted anesthetic experience or gone use it as an independent year just by being a good worker who likes a regional environment and is known to LRH. Um, the actual job in LRH itself, look, the caseload and variety in LRH, uh, I've worked in about six different anesthetic departments. I've never seen such a high caseload, high procedural levels of multiple, uh, high, high levels of procedures, sorry, multiple orthopedic theatres. And most of the anesthetists have an incredibly high level of skill with nerve blocks, spinals, epidurals, and other extended uh, techniques of anesthesia, which you can struggle to get in some other places. Um, there's also a large amount of visiting specialist surgeons. You get everything from respiratory bronchs, cardiothoracics, um, lots of orthopedic, urology, um, really gen surge, pediatrics, more pediatrics than you get a lot elsewhere. So you get an incredibly varied um, basically anesthetic experience. Uh, if I look at my logbook for the five years of anesthetics training, I've done uh, of the 1,100 cases I need to do in two months, I've done 500 of them. Um, you'll never get that anywhere else. And um, that's been noted very much. The other um, benefit is you're working with the same team every day. Again, this has benefits and detriments, <laughs> but it's mostly beneficial. And this is something most people who are in your early level of the careers, such as you guys, may not realize is such a bonus. I've moved around every three to six months for the last five years in departments of sometimes over two to 300 people, big ICUs, EDs, and everything like that. Knowing the registrars in your adjacent fields, knowing your uh, colleagues and knowing the hospital community confers so many benefits, just a peace of mind. You also get uh, a lot more primary exposure and involvement with big resuscitations in cases. There are multiple times at Box Hill or at Frankston where I'd get kicked off for cardiothoracic resuscitation uh, uh, patient or like a big AAA because the three or four fellows lining up to be involved in that case want to do stuff and I'd just be relegated to the back of a room or not even that sometimes. Whereas here, especially in the ICU notably and in the ED I've seen as well, 
um, you'll get much, much more involvement hands-on. Uh, there may be less often patients crashing, but you'll be much more involved. And it's a really good chance to test yourself and test your skills as you develop as critical care doctors. And finally, I think this has been noted by a lot of people, the location's really good for people who are outdoorsy, who love the beach, which is about an hour away, the mountains, about an hour away, good coffee. And if you're like me, the wineries that are in this area, especially the Pinot Noir, is out of this world. Thank you for a beautiful presentation of uh, not only your own specialty, but of the, the benefits of uh, of the, the clinical exposure that you can actually uh, access in a rural and regional site. I'd like to now welcome um, Dr. Amanda Ormerod, who is uh, a haematologist and palliative care specialist, who will share a, a little bit uh, with us about her career journey and basic physician training, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, physician training at Latrobe Regional in Traralgon. Thank you, Amanda. So as per um, the other speakers, you know, I can only sort of say that working regionally is uh, fantastic. You get a lot more exposure and experience than you would in the city. Um, I started my journey in Sydney, moved over to Canberra, and then came down to Gippsland probably in about 2010. And I've sort of been working around through Victoria and also um, in Melbourne for haematology training and for palliative care training. I think working regionally, you actually get a lot more exposure to undifferentiated patients. So you get to be the first people that actually diagnose something. So a bit like Max was saying and James was saying, you actually get the hands-on experience. I mean, I remember working at Peter Mac and you, you know, you see these tertiary patients, um, you know, prior to your exams and all of that that you're doing for your physician exams. But when you come out to the country, you actually see them in your clinic. <laughs> they come into you, um, they've just been referred and, you know, nobody knows what's going on and you have to be the one that diagnoses it. So if you like working up patients and you like working with multiple people, I find physician training and physician work is fantastic because you get to work with people like Max because you need to, from a haematology perspective, we need to send people to radiology. So you need to get to know your radiologist, you need to get to know your anaesthetists because you need to rely on your colleagues to be able to do the interventions for you to be able to diagnose your patients. And then once you've got the diagnosis, then you then follow them through and have their, you know, for haematologists, their, their chemotherapy or their treatment. And then and the reason I did palliative care was because I wanted to be able to do that extra component so that I could help manage not only um, people at end of life, but people that, for example, in myeloma have a lot of problems with um, pain management. So sort of delving a little bit into Max's area into um, pain management, um, which can be done in, you know, um, anesthetics as well we deal with more chronic pain management so from my perspective you know if you can work regionally you actually get a lot more exposure at LRH we've got um, advanced training and we also have basic training um, we're trying to increase the level of basic training from a BPT1 to a BPT2 in the next few years we have haematology training that's accredited and we also have palliative care training that's accredited as GPs and also as physician trainees so these are positions that are highly competitive in the, in the city, um, but there's not as many people that want to do it when they come out. And there's much more opportunities in the country to do things. So I'll just keep it brief because a lot of it's rep repetition, but it's great. You've got the lifestyle and you've got the opportunities to delve into things and be more responsible. You don't have 10 layers of people that are looking forward to um, trying to get that new diagnosis. I have a question, please, Amanda. I'm interested to know if there's been any unexpected twists or turns in your career journey. Definitely. Um, I started out in the lab. Um, I decided when I was a, you know, finishing high school that I didn't want to um, deal with patients because I'm an introvert, so I don't like dealing with pe people as much. So I thought I'd go off into the lab and worked overseas in Tanzania for a few years and then decided to come back and do medicine. So then did medicine and then... So now I have the capacity not only to understand the lab things from a lab perspective, but also as a haematologist, you do lab training as well, or you can choose to do clinical. But because of my previous background, I wanted to do the lab training. So, and that's why I've added in um, palliative care afterwards, because it's there's so much you can do. So from haematology, you do from the from birth to death. So adding on that final little extra bit was, was beneficial for me. I'm going to hand the... Uh... The microphone across to my radiology colleague now at this stage, Dr. Harry Krishna, 
I myself am an international medical graduate. I um, am originally from Malaysia and um, I, I trained in interventional radiology in Perth. And the idea was to go back and serve the Malaysian government, but my family um, um, persuaded me otherwise and said Australia is a good uh, place to, to be. And I sat for the exams and uh, looked further afield for a, a place to be. And I came to Gippsland. I was showed the area and uh, looked at the opportunities in the Troop Regional Hospital. I was quite interested and I stayed on. I've been here for six years as a uh, radiologist and with uh, interventional uh, speciality. So um, uh, in, in a sense, you know, uh, with the carrier pathway, I'll, I will just uh, speak to you uh, a little later because uh, I'm sure I'm speaking to an audience who, is, uh, who are all local graduates. So I'll, I'll come to that uh, a little later. And, um, you know, in terms of radiology, um, you know, it's, uh, it's tech heavy. It's tech heavy. If you like technology blended with medicine, it would be the way to go. It's a fast developing specialty, especially with, you know, all the new um, MRI and uh, CT technology that's just advancing every year. You get uh, more and more uh, detail with the pathology that you see, and it's uh, pretty exciting that way. And um, the, the good thing about radiology is it covers all specialties. So, you know, if you're sort of um, um, hard up for what you're trying to decide to do in life and you want to do uh, everything, then uh, I guess radiology is the way to go. You become a doctor's doctor. Uh, you become a, a specialist for other doctors and you will help them guide uh, treatment pathways for patients. So, uh, you know, that's the, one of the things they say, advantages is a nine to five job. Uh, that is not true nowadays. Now with the workload that we experience, a lot of people stay beyond five o'clock and especially for, for intervention, that's not true. So you'll be on call, you'll have to come in uh, at all hours to do intervention. So it can be quite busy. So uh, the other thing is, what's the, the downside? The downside is that uh, you don't have patient interaction. And there's that uh, often that trope about uh, radiologists being hidden in a cave in a dark room, not interacting with uh, anyone else. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, of course, you don't see patients, you don't see ward patients, you don't see them in the clinics. So there's no sense of follow up. You don't see the sense of how pathology develops and you don't see the sense of uh, true gratification from your patient. That, that is a little bit lost. But um, otherwise, you know, it, it is a very a wide expanse of uh, uh, way you, you look at things, interpret things. And the main thing about being a radiologist is that you should be able to uh, not just interpret an image. It's not just about grayscale imaging, black and white. It's all about uh, the clinical impact that you can have on a, on a patient. And so what you need to do is integrate that um, information that you get from these images and use your subset of uh, experience, your skill, and your attention to detail to bring about a possible diagnosis, bring about some uh, uh, differentials and formulate advice. Formulate an ad advice for your colleagues as to, to steer the patient towards health and uh, dealing with the pathology that you see. So, um, you know, uh, if, if you talk about the benefits of uh, rural work, you know, everybody has said it before. There's a wide range of uh, pathology that you see. I mean, radiology, the thing about it, it's, it's not site specific. The way we work is that it's all computer based and it's all based on uh, imaging that you can access from anywhere in the world. So uh, to say that you will be limited in terms of pathology, that's not certainly true. You can have uh, access to all sorts of such specialities, pediatrics, obstetrics, medicine, surgery, you name it at any time. And uh, certainly when you talk about working here in uh, Latrobe, uh, that's where I'm primarily at, is that uh, you form a lot of uh, close relationships with uh, the people that refer these cases to you, the GPs, the specialists. And so at the end of what you would report, there's often a sense of communication. You have to communicate these findings on a personal level to uh, whoever it is you need to be, especially if it's an urgent finding. So uh, there's a sense of appreciation for your work, especially if you work in the hospital. And uh, on, on my perspective as an interventionist, uh, there's a lot of things that you do hands-on uh, with all the biopsies, 
the drainages, the embolizations, uh, the uh, you know all these things that you can help with the patient's outcome, and particularly when surgeons have uh, no way to treat something like a chronic deep abscess or a bleeder that they can't stop endoscopically or surgically, you can actually make quite a difference. Not um, not only just as an interventionist, but as a uh, diagnostic radiologist, you pick up the bleeder using a multi-phase CT scan and then convey these results quickly so that they can act upon these findings as soon as possible. So you can have a dramatic effect on the patient's outcome. So the, the other sense is, uh, the other thing about working rule is that it just takes me 10 minutes to go to work. I love that. Um, I don't have to deal with the snarl of traffic. Um, and there's a uh, great uh, support, uh, you know, here uh, there are challenges to setting up an interventional service or even uh, with uh, radiology. So you get a lot of support with the people you work with and uh, particularly with the opportunities for leadership and uh, teaching, uh, you get the to mold your working environment to your what you need to see in terms of uh, how you'd like to uh, proceed with services in a rural area. So you get a little bit of uh, independence in how you'd like to do that. So in certainly here, um, you know, you can train up the nurses, you can train up uh, your colleagues. Uh, and uh, we've started things like pick line services for nurses, which is very exciting. And, um, you know, the, the thing is, there's always a great need for radiologists, especially in uh, rural areas, especially on the ground. And, uh, that's the thing about uh, over here. Here it's run by IMED, which is a private service. And uh, unlike the metro areas, uh, the big government hospitals, which are state funded, uh, here it's privately run. So, but still, uh, you know, we are very much short of um, on site radiologists who can help out with the procedures and reporting. So, there's a great lacune in, in that sense, and there's a great need for it. So, that's why the uh, college in itself, um, so I'll speak a little bit about training. So I am the director of training in Latrobe Regional Hospital uh, on behalf of IMED and also in uh, conjunction with Ranska, which is the radiology college. So uh, we have rotating registrars uh, sent in from the Alfred. So the Alfred has got what we call local area network trainers. Uh, so we've got six uh, network training areas or six lands of which uh, this region at the hub is the Alfred. So they send about uh, one or two radio, uh, registrars who, to come to LRH or uh, SAIL, and they help out with reporting, with procedures, with uh, uh, training uh, as required. Now, there's another category of uh, trainee, which is called the IRTP can candidate. And so this candidate is uh, funded by uh, IMED, and uh, he is uh, mainly working in the rural areas. And Andrew Van is our current trainee. So if you want to get information about how he does it, so in the, in the sense that he is not linked to the Alfred, he's uh, uh, sort of works for IMED and he, however, is part of the Ranska training. So he just spends about one or two years in the Alfred, does all the rotations in the major hospitals and subspecialties. But the main uh, time he, he, he works with us is uh, in uh, rural Gippsland, which covers Warragul, Sale, and uh, Latrobe Regional Hospital. So, uh, you know, the thing about working here is that um, it's the collegiate uh, atmosphere that you get. So we get a, a fair number of meetings on a week, in a week, uh, medical, surgical, uh, and oncology is huge. So uh, certainly, you know, with Said and, and Amanda, I get to speak to them on a weekly basis with the lymphoma meetings and medical meetings and the Greeks cancer oncology meetings. Uh, to discuss uh, cases and uh, you, you have that sort of personal friendship and uh, certainly with the surgeons to help out with all the embolizations. Just yesterday we had a patient who was bleeding profusely from a D1 ulcer and uh, the endoscopist could not find the bleed, they couldn't stop it and uh, they asked my help and I and I came in and the patient was a 67 year old man who had lost him close to you know about uh, 1.5 liters of blood. He was bleeding away on the table. They sent him to the lab, cat lab using that machine that you see there, we uh, got into the common hepatic artery, got into the gastrointestinal artery and deployed coils to stop the bleed. And the uh, effect was dramatic. The hemodynamic uh, is, you know, changes, are the blood pressure went up. And the patient avoided uh, surgery, which could be you know, debilitating and we really 
in surgeons were saying, you know, he might not even survive uh, surgery as such. So uh, certainly with radiology and interventional services, you can do a lot uh, in, in terms of what you can do in rural Gippsland. Otherwise, the patients will have to be sent to metro areas. There'll be a loss of time, you know, in terms of transport and the, the expense that would be involved. So, you know, you've got all of this over here. It'd be really exciting to be part of that team. Thanks a lot. Wow, thanks, Harry. That's really uh, inspirational, actually, to hear how things are booming in uh, in uh, Gippsland with uh, the radiology uh, uh, access uh, for training. Uh, do you actually have basic training opportunities for uh, for say our grit interns that might be coming through? Uh, how would they access uh, you know the early parts of the radiology training pathway? Yeah, so for the training program, what happens is uh, the hospitals, the way you apply for it is that there are jobs that are uh, advertised by the hospitals that have the training programs. And these sites are hospitals which are, tra which are recognized by Ranskas as uh, uh, accredited sites. So you have to look out for these places. Uh, all you need to do is, is just have two years after your exams and that you are interested in the exam, you know, uh, in, in the specialty. You know, you should be dedicated to pursuing a career in clinical radiology, you must have good interpersonal and professional communication skills, have a high standard of academic performance. That's what they look for. And then uh, apply to these hospital sites when they uh, have a trading position for radiology and uh, get into the program. So once the hospital hires you, you can uh, get uh, in contact with uh, Ranska, which is the college, and then get into that five-year training program. So the five years, the initial two years will be uh, mainly with uh, uh, basic training, with general clinical radiology training, and the next, uh, uh, sorry, three years for general clinical radiology training, and the final two years are system-focused rotations for advanced clinical radiology training. So once the five years are done, you've got your exams, and then after that, you're released into the system to, to work. Well, thanks so much. That's, uh, that's a really comprehensive um, summary of what opportunities are available. So thank you, Harry. And uh, now uh, I'd like to move on to uh, Mr. Saifullah Sayed, who is one of, our, one of our team and one of our regional training hub clinical champions, a, a passionate, uh, training development uh, practitioner and surgical educator with the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons. And I'm sure you'll enjoy hearing Sai Fuller talk about his journey. And uh, good evening, everybody. So I think with today's talk, um, I've heard my colleagues about asking the, the junior doctors about um, advantages of regional training. Um, and so I'm hoping to expand a little bit more we want them to, to, in addition to training here, come back as consultants too uh, in the long-term careers. So my talk is slightly different and I've got some PowerPoint slides if that's okay. So Gippsland in general is a remarkable region with a huge potential. I think some of you during your rotations as interns, you'd have seen what Gippsland has to offer. Now the Gippsland region itself, it's the biggest region in Victoria and consists of East Gippsland, what we call as a part of it famous as the Bainsdale, Wellington, where the Central Gippsland Health Services, Latro Valley or Latro Regional Hospital, Baba, and South Gippsland with Warragul and Basco Health, the Wantagi Hospital. This roughly shows the population in each of these uh, regions. And the statistics say that they seem to be growing average with the state growth of about 4%, but some of these regions are much more. Now, in this region, there is about five um, networks or teaching hospitals, the Bainsdale Regional Health Service, Central Gippsland Health, Lateral Regional Hospital, Bascos Health, and Wargal Hospital. And they're all linked with Monash University, which now forms the Gippsland Regional Training Hub, uh, which, which we endeavor or envision will help in setting up a, a regional training center within the Gippsland region. This part has been well covered by most of my colleagues. What are the advantages of um, uh, working in a regional area? So I won't go in depth with this, but 
A few things to highlight. If you are in the metro or the city, you probably will be looking at most of the things, yes, but a bit more subspecialized. Whereas in the regional setting, you will be looking at a variety or diverse um, cases. You will be being probably very close to the workplace, good accommodation, and most of the times it's free, good food. You do have research opportunities. Now, when you work in these uh, regional settings, you are still collaborating with some of the tertiary hospitals and you get a lot in terms of leisure activities to cater to the needs of each individual. So in terms of sort of looking at a holistic approach, a very good work-life balance and a sense of belonging. Uh, I think it's close-knit communities. Um, you, um, everyone knows each other. There is this kind of um, uh, a sense of you know, togetherness. So it does tick most of the boxes when you sort of select why go regional. Surgical perspective. In the regional setting, what you get to experience is a, a diversity of cases. There is good hands-on teaching and training. In this setup, it's usually, most units will have a, an intern, occasional resident, registrars and consultant. The small teams, which means you are working in close, uh, in close uh, proximity with the registrars and the consultants. We did hear earlier on, this is a time where you can build good rapport or relationships with your with your seniors, the registrars, fellows, or the consultants, and some of them can be your mentors or referees as you proceed further in your journey. Good operative experience as well. What I mean by that is in the in the re, in the metro setup, you may or may not get to go into theater, depending on how many members are on your team. You may be the second or third assistant or just an observer. But in these setups, you might be actually uh, a first assistant in some of the cases or some small cases. You may be actually doing the case with somebody uh, supervising or supporting you. This is a good learning opportunity. We'll see in the next, uh, when we discuss some of the uh, individuals who have gone through this journey, how it has helped them. Based on your uh, goals, skills, education, and interests, this would be a very good uh, opportunity that you can utilize. For a surgeon, um, a, a regional setup offers a wide experience. So you can choose, you can choose to be a, a general surgeon, which means you're dealing with different pathologies, but you can also subspecialize as an area of interest. In the in the metro, you get to see specialists and subspecialists. And we already know about the um, terminology of acute surgical unit, which deals with most of the surgical emergencies. But in the regional settings, um, there's not really an acute surgical unit because there's just the general surgery teams that deal with the acute surgery, elective surgery uh, as well. So it gives, that, it gives the thrill or the adrenaline rush and you get to see your results and pretty much straight away. This is just sharing some of the journeys of, uh, of various individuals. Obviously, for uh, privacy and confidentiality, we can't tell the names. But as we discuss, you know, when we discuss the cases in the meeting, this is Dr. CF. So essentially, so these are all actually true stories from past and present. Uh, this doctor has just finished their year of internship in Gippsland between the various networks. And um, during that time, uh, they worked on some research project and then went to a, a metro hospital for the PGY2 year or the res year one residency. Completed that and as a PGY, as a PGY2 uh, has come as a non accredited registrar to one of the organizations here uh, in the Gippsland region and is currently preparing for um, advanced or a, or a 
accredited training position, what we call as surgical education and training at the SET program with the College of Surgeons. This is another doctor uh, who came from the, the rural generalist program. So completed the internship year, went into GP practice, he used some of his uh, surgical skills and is now doing what they call as a procedural GP. I think James and Max did touch on these. This is a, a subspecialty where you can go into general practice, but you have a, a subspecialty. When I say subspecialty, it can be a procedural GP, you're doing general surgical procedures, you're doing a GP anesthetist or a GP obstetrician, or you are in the emergency department. So there are various opportunities. I think um, if Jules is still around, uh, she'll be the person who will uh, guide you through this in the VIGP program. This is another doctor, essentially an international medical graduate who spent, who joined as a resident in one of the organizations in Gippsland. And uh, after a few years, he joined as a resident, worked as an unaccredited registrar, and then applied to the surgical training program with uh, referees from within the region. He's now completed his, uh, his advanced surgical training, is a consultant and has gone for, for the specialist training. Uh, another doctor who, who was within the organization, again, uh, completed internship year, did PGY2, PGY3, and then went on to the anesthetic training program. So within the various organizations that we discuss, there are uh, opportunities for interns and then PGY2, PGY3, and then uh, some specialties do offer the specialty training within these organizations. Otherwise, some of the others at this point in time, they do go to the city hospital for the recruitment and then come back. As far as general surgery is, uh, is concerned, the, the SET program, currently the setup is such that they are recruited in one of the tertiary hospitals in the city, but they do have rotations coming back to some of these uh, hospitals. This slide I just put in to show that after your training, there is a lot of job opportunities. And you can see that healthcare is at the top. So there's a lot happening in the regional settings. The government itself has developed a program uh, to promote to promote doctors um, in the in the in the regional and sub-regional areas, not only for um, for the uh, for the logistics, but also to serve the community in these regions so that they don't need to go to the city for uh, most of these procedures. In other words, what they're hoping or aiming to do is to bring the services closer to where they are. So there's a lot happening in Gippsland. It's what we call as a place to be, a place to study, live and work. And what we are hoping is a place to call home. For us, we are already here, but for junior doctors, we'd like to uh, invite you. Thank you. So last but not least is uh, Dr. Stuart Thomas. Uh, Stuart is, uh, has been uh, presented at these nights uh, many times and is a passionate regional clinical educator, a consultant psychiatrist and the coordinator of psychiatry training at La Trobe Regional Hospital. So thank you for coming, Stuart. Thank you for having me, folks. It's um, great to be able to address you. I'll say a little bit about psychiatry in general, a little bit about my journey and a little bit about what LRH um, offers if you want to train in. Gippsland. Psychiatry is the medical specialty dealing with the mind. It's a medical specialty because we believe that the mind arises from the whole human being and it's really the epitome of biopsychosocial medicine. We're well placed therefore to help people with emotional problems. And, and I think psychiatrists think that we, we really practice medicine in all its fullness because we do, because it's truly biopsychosocial. We engage with other doctors and a full range of other health professionals. 
I think it's the most stimulating area of study that I've ever engaged with. Um, it allows a, a fusion of medicine with sociology, history, the law, philosophy, amongst others. Sometimes, for instance, we treat people actually against their will. Fancy treating someone against their will. You can imagine the legal and philosophical issues that typically arise that you have to engage with creatively. It uses really sophisticated technologies, such as um, neurostimulation machines of different kinds, the, the tech of which is absolutely uh, up to the minute. Drugs developed over the past decade, some drugs we use have been developed over the last 60 years. Um, electroconvulsive therapy developed in the 1930s and psychotherapy, uh, the principles of which were, were squarely established in the 1920s. And actually those psychotherapy principles pervade everything that psychiatrists do. So imagine the bedrock of psychiatry having been completely described a hundred years ago. So I was a med student on a psych ward. Um, I met a guy who played the guitar with the technique. He was playing the guitar in the middle of the psych ward and his, his playing I thought was thought disordered. Imagine thought disordered music. And I thought, wow, I think I have to find out more about this. Um, I then worked for five years in a very large old fashioned psych hospital, which is pretty much all being demolished now. And then I moved to St. Vincent's in Melbourne for another four. Then I did 10 years of solo private practice in psychotherapy. And since 2012, so what, 11 years now, I've been coming to the Trobe Regional Hospital I, I drive up or train up every week. I uh, used to work for a day and a half. Now I'm working for three days uh, a week. And I, I come up every week and I go back to Melbourne um, for, the, um, for the rest of the week. I work as Director of Psychiatry Training at LRH. I work in perinatal psychiatry. I'm in charge of psychotherapy training. And I'm interested, as I think a lot of psychiatrists are, in the way mental illness develops longitudinally, um, beginning from the moment of conception, actually. And mental illness and mental health really unfold in the context of our relationships and our environment. I got the idea of working in Gippsland because I've got family connections to the region. And so coming up every week, I actually find quite refreshing. It breaks my week up really nicely. You can do your entire psychiatry training at La Trobe Regional Hospital. You can do adult, child, consultation liaison, which means we're on the medical and surgical wards. Old age, um, you can travel out to one of the prisons to do forensic um, and you can do psychotherapy with us. I myself every day treat uh, depressed babies, uh, psychotic, depressed neonates. Neonates can get depressed. Um, psychotic mums, um, adolescents, adults, people with depression, schizophrenia, mania, different kinds of really difficult personality disorders. So I train the registrars. Um, I enjoy supervising nurses, as, as many of my colleagues uh, also do. And I really enjoy rich interactions with my peers. LRH um, will uh, readily facilitate peer meetings where we can all learn from each other. I'm continually learning from all the people I interact with. Um, I had the chance to contribute recently to the Royal Commission, um, whereby the government trying to look in more detail at what makes, at how we can really improve psych services. So I commend psychiatry to you as a worthy way to earn a living and, uh, and to contribute to society. And I've found that Gippsland is a great place to do it. So once again, thank you all for attending. Thanks everybody. It's been a great pleasure being the chair.